It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. It's time for our all-star panel. Uh, Lots of craziness this week, lots of fun. All the zombie Karens at school boards. Can't wait to talk about that. But first, foremost, uh, some movement on the infrastructure. Could we get both? Could we get none? Uh, Is it too small, too big? Here to share some thoughts on the infrastructure bills and how they're going to make their way through the uh, the system as is. I've asked our all-star panel to come join us. Uh, Lauren Windsor, executive producer of The Undercut, executive director of American Family Voices and partner at Democracy Partners. Lauren, thanks for being here. Thanks. Glad to be here. Uh, also, Scott Dworkin, co-founder of the Democratic Coalition. Scott, thanks for being here, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And, of course, the great Rich Ojeda, national spokesperson for No Dems Left Behind. Uh, Rich, good to see you again, man. Hey, everyone. So let's let's get jump right into this. The infrastructure plan, the bipartisan one, went through uh, went through the channels, $1.2 trillion almost immediately. They're moving forward on the $3.5 trillion. Uh, is it enough? Let's, let's start with you, Scott. What do you think about it, Rick? I meant to, because, I mean, you're the big union guy. Do you think it's enough? I don't think I don't think it's enough. I think it's the culmination of uh, decades of no, not investing in things. Uh, I think we've got so much to do that it's not enough. My problem is it might be too much because there's too much to attack to tear it apart. Yeah, and they they try to compare it. Oh, this is the New Deal, a Green Deal, or whatever they were talking talking about, and it really doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it it's uh, there's a lot of uh, information that is just disgusting where they're talking about we build roads and bridges but it has nothing infrastructure has nothing to do with the internet and it's like our entire lives are built around the internet and there's people on Indian reservations who have no internet and no access to internet like we need to change this thing because that's the information pipeline and people are isolated and it's that really hurts them you know I think it's nuts they're trying to do it without having any climate change provisions I mean how do you have infrastructure that doesn't have uh, climate change built into that? You know, look at the country, uh, it, Texas, with the the power grid. <laughs> look at California on fire, Montana. We got a hundred and seven wildfires going at once. But to your point, Scott, you know, one of the things that I'm I'm actually surprised at in the bipartisan bill, they you got 19 Republicans to vote to allow Davis Bacon to stay. Uh, so the fact that you're going to have prevailing wage laws still in this with 19 Republicans coming along, I think is a good thing. I think the hard infrastructure stuff is it's it's, it's not nearly enough. We should have gotten more, but you got what you could. Now it's the other side that we've got to do more with, and we'll see what happens with that. And, and also don't forget that, you know, it's not just Indian reservations that are without broadband. I mean, I can take you five minutes from where I live here in West Virginia, and I can show you people that absolutely have to go to a McDonald's and sit in the, you know, inside of McDonald's for their kids to be able to get broadband to do their homework. And that's just reality. Now, you look at this, and one of the, one of my concerns is uh, that you know, the, the political wins that may happen in the Democrats who sometimes convene circular fire, firing squads, I worry that down the road, uh, this ends up being one of those scenarios where if we can't get both, we get nothing. Uh, well, I understand, understand that everybody needs it. Infrastructure is a huge situation in this country right now. Bridges are falling in. The roads absolutely suck. And that's all across the country. So everybody should be for something. You know, and that's where we're getting. We're getting something. We're not getting what we really should get in terms of infrastructure. But the key thing is, is to make sure that we don't allow all these people, especially who have nitpicked and cut this thing to pieces, to be able to stand in the way and act like they were part of it. No different than when Alex Mooney was down here the day after they voted against basically funding vaccination centers. And he's taking photographs of himself and they're acting like he's the one that made it happen. So, you know, the Republicans are going to do everything in their power to make sure we go into 2022 with absolute doom and gloom so they can claim to be the ones that can fix it. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, they need infrastructure, too. Yeah. Anybody share my concerns? We get nothing. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, because of because of how politics is. And that's exactly what the Republicans want. The Republicans want nothing more than to go into 2022 and say, look, man, nothing. Look at your roads, nothing, because the Democrats couldn't follow through. You just need to get the Republicans in there. I think that's a really dangerous ploy. I mean, you know, you have uh, COVID surging across the country, which, you know, the GOP owns that. They're the ones that are preventing uh, mask mandates, uh, you know, sowing the seeds of distrust of public health institutions and the vaccine. And I think that if, you know, the hospital failures occur, uh, these hospital systems across the country, like what's about to happen in, they will. in Mississippi in five to 10 days, um, that's going it, to, it's a huge infrastructure problem. You know, we don't have uh, viable healthcare systems across the country, and we don't have any infrastructure to uh, spending to back that up. I think that it, that's going to be a terrible, terrible um, outcome for for Republicans, and you know, it, it, beyond the partisan element to it, it's a terrible outcome for Americans. I mean, we we should want infrastructure. We should want uh, healthcare systems to be viable. No, uh, for- uh, Fourteen years ago, uh, the I-35 bridge collapsed. We've been talking about infrastructure all of that time, and and I would argue years before it. Uh, this this call for infrastructure is not new. Uh, what is new is finally uh, somebody got it moving in the right direction. And I give Joe Biden credit, and, and Mitch McConnell gave Joe Biden credit uh, to usher getting this ushered through to this point. It's something the former guy, I don't even think, tried. Well, actually yeah. didn't try because if you from the reports are, uh, he said they're not going to move on infrastructure until they stop investigating him. So we yeah. were screwed for four years. Uh, so I give I give Biden credit on this. A- absolutely. But also, you know, the thing is, is that the Republicans bought in on a lot of this and exactly what Lauren was basically saying. You know, they're the ones who was against the, the mask and they've called this a hoax and and they've been pushing the big lie and all that garbage. At the end of the day, this is going to blow up in their face. And the coronavirus is definitely going to blow up in their face. And like you said, we're only about 10 days away from being in the true blue COVID hell. But once again, I think that this infrastructure with the way that they've been fighting to try to keep anything from happening, I think that could blow up in their face as well, too. Everybody keeps saying that we could lose the house in 2022. But I'll tell you, you know, besides the fact that they're killing their own base, Number one and number two, people are waking up, even on the Republican side of the aisle. Yeah, I will nitpick like on messaging, like one little bit. I wouldn't say a true blue COVID hell. I would say red alert COVID hell. There you go. There you go. Well, you know, this week the UN came out with a report saying code red for humanity with their uh, their climate report saying you know it, it's going to get worse than uh, than we imagined the fifty year the once every fifty year heat wave. Uh, that was once every 50 years is now once a decade and soon will be twice every seven years. Um, yeah. Code red for humanity. Yeah. It's a little tough for everybody, I guess. I mean, what, one of the things is like, what, what is it that happened to these governors when they were children to make them hate kids, to make them hate people, to make them hate America, to make them hate the country that they were born in for the most part. Um, I, I don't understand exactly what they're, trying to accomplish because it, it doesn't make any sense it's like are you being blackmailed by a foreign power because that actually makes more sense to me than anything else because it just doesn't i don't understand oh i'm defiant i'm anti-mask like it doesn't make any sense the numbers don't make any sense the polling doesn't make any sense like it literally makes no sense they, they want to coddle this five percent base or whatever of crazy people um because they're scared of them I, you don't want a governor like that. They shouldn't be in government if, they, if they're scared and terrified like this. But I think that what, what the situation is, especially when you're talking about Governor Abbott and Governor Death Santis, and I believe that is, is that they are actually competing for Donald Trump's love. They're hoping that one of them is either going to be looked at as his VP and if he runs in 2024, or if he can't run in 2024, they're looking at him to say, this is my guy because they obviously don't care about their people. They don't care about the children. You know, I mean, we have a global pandemic that is that is absolutely killing people and they're not even wanting, they're actually not, they don't, it's not that they don't want to help children. They're doing everything in their power to go against the people who want to help children. That's, this is horrible. Yeah, I'm right there with you. But, you know, in looking at this infrastructure plan, because this is, you know, this is something that, um, you know, I've been calling for for years. It's something that I want to see done. Um, 
I, I'm looking at this in a way, and, and the pandemic being all part of this, uh, I'm looking at this in a way of, you know, how how do you see this getting through? That's a good question. Because you know, I'm in this weird spot because uh, I want to talk about the pandemic and I want to go there, but I'm, I'm, I'm on the infrastructure. Uh, Tell me something. Did the infrastructure bill say anything in reference to unions? In terms of, uh, did, did it highlight anything in reference to unions? Uh, all, all that's in there is in the $1.2 trillion plan. They left Davis-Bacon in place for all federal plans. Uh, so any federal work, work that's going to be done will be covered under prevailing wage laws. Uh, and anybody knows we want prevailing wage laws uh, to protect local construction trades and the workers there. We don't want transient workers coming through, doing shoddy fly-by-night work, and then yeah. disappearing. Uh, you want to have a, a local construction base and you want qualified people to do it and prevailing wage laws do that. Uh, I also want to see you know, pro, uh, project labor agreements as part of this so that we, we make sure that those plant, whatever we're building is built with the best labor under the best conditions and we get the things that we need on time, under cost uh, and, and durable, uh, not, not having things that are going to be, you know, 10 years down the road, we're gonna have to replace them. So for me, that's part of it. Now, as I understand, in the $3.5 trillion plan, they do have some components of what was the PRO Act. Uh, what the, I guess what they're deeming as economic. They're uh, parts of, of fining companies for uh, unfair labor practices and, and stuff like that. Going to see how that, that, that makes it its way through the amendment process. Uh, but that's what I've seen. Has anybody else seen anything? Well, my thing with that is, is, and the reason why I ask you that question is West Virginia done away with the prevailing wage. Now I know this is going to be on a federal level, right. so I'm assuming that that's still going to, it's still going to work because yeah. once again, West Virginia has been horrific towards unions and it's a shame. Now, sadly, once you've done away with your local prevailing wage laws, because it is a prevailing wage, wages do go down and it's yeah. the wage that's most often uh, reported, not the average. Everyone thinks it's an average wage. It's the one that's most often reported. And unions are very proud of the wages that they get for their their members, and they report them. And that's why it's generally considered the union wage. And when you do away with a state level, uh, it ends up pulling the wages down, and it, it pulls everything down. Uh, so I, I I hope your governor, uh, who has said that they passed it and it didn't work, will unpass it and and put it back into place so that it can go back uh, to doing the things it needed to do. Um, but real quick, back to the uh, the infrastructure bill before we move along to other topics. Uh, anything in there that we're particularly happy with or anything that we're particularly unhappy with? Let's well, start with you, I, Scott. I think that uh, anything that has to do with, with infrastructure overall and not just the bridges and roads. Yes, we need to fix our bridges and roads, but I like the fact that it's expanded. Uh, and and I think the the... I, it, we're maybe overlooking the fact that it's the bipartisan part of things is, is huge. Like it's a big deal, uh, at least, you know, being in DC, it, it re really makes it, I guess, a, a little different in regards to the environment, at least for a moment. And then people go back to their bickering, but I, it shows that it's possible. It shows that we can actually reach deals. Um, this is more along the lines of, Democrats presenting something that they can't say no to uh, because they'd just be so ridiculous. Like they can't say no to this package. And so they had to say yes. They didn't have an option. They wanted to win re-election and this would lose that, I think. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just excited that it passed overall. I never thought that it would. Yeah, yeah. Lauren, your thoughts? I mean, I just go back again to climate change provisions. They had to move anything that was like, you know, green energy related into the budget reconciliation bill, which, you know, you have moderates already saying that they're um, uh, uncomfortable with the $3.5 trillion price tag of the budget reconciliation. Um, and so, you know, do we get this passed um, because progressives are, uh, you know, threatening to say, you know, if you don't pass the budget reconciliation, we're not going to, you know, pass uh, the infrastructure bill. So, yeah, you see me, I, I'm looking at the three point five trillion dollar plan and I'm going, it's so big and so easy to attack. And I remember a day where you know maybe you guys are going to will remember where budget used to, where Congress used to have to pass like 13 individual uh, budget appropriation bills. And I've been asking why they're not using those as a way of passing budget bills. Uh, that maybe you get 13 bites at the apple instead of one or two, 
then you could package it easier. Uh, just just a thought. Uh, but let's let's wrap up with you, uh, uh, Rich. Uh, anything in here you like or dislike? You know, at the end of the day, I, I'm I live in West Virginia. Now I'm I'm moving to North Carolina, but right now I'm in a state that is 50th in the nation in terms of infrastructure. Our roads are horrific. Uh, broadband is is not even exist in, in in many areas where I'm from in the first congressional district. So right now I'm just I'm just happy for anything because, like you said. You know, at any given time, this could have fell through. And I know that they're they've chipped away at it. And and in terms of in terms of green, you know, energy things like that. But right now, we just got to have something. It's just brutal. So it's it, seeing anything kind of gives me hope. Yeah, real quick, I want to. I, I didn't get your predictions. Um, you think we'll get one, both, or or nothing? Let's start with you, Scott. One, both, or nothing. In regards to. The bill. You're going to get the the bipartisan bill, the 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 the, the three point five trillion. You get both of those. You get one of them, or you get nothing. What are you thinking? Both. You think you get both? Yes. Uh, Lauren, your thoughts? I mean, the issue here for me is like, I don't think that Republicans are going to be uh, so hardcore to you know try to win the you know, the, the title of uh, having uh, torpedoed the the infrastructure bill. Um, but I think that progressives in the House are really riled up. And if the um, reconciliation uh, doesn't go the way they want it, I mean, you know, it, it could be that we don't have either. Um, but my guess would be that we, we come through with something, like at least one of the bills, just because I don't think that either side wants to you know be blamed for having no infrastructure yeah your you're scott your thought rich I, I i doubt very seriously we get to 3.5 because at the end of the day this is a democratic administration and they the last thing they want to see when they go into 22 and 24 is democrats with wins so you know we'll get something but it's not going to be the big stuff yeah we're not going to get the, we're not going to get the big one and there's a part of me that goes uh, in the House, I think a couple of Republicans will be the ones that save the uh, the bill and, and move it forward, uh, which would be very interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a quick break right here. On the other side, I'm uh, going to talk about the anniversary, the fourth anniversary of uh, the murder of Heather Heyer and the Charlottesville uh, Unite the Right ra rally. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on the other side of this. Going to take a quick break right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. Smith Show. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1937. That was the day the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union was founded after the Victoria strike of 1934 that established the Union Hiring Hall, West Coast Union leaders embarked on an inland campaign to organize the thousands of warehouse workers who handled shipped goods. But West Coast dock workers overwhelmingly chose to join the CIO after it was expelled from the AFL earlier that year. They found that the ILA planned to abandon the warehouse workers they had worked so hard to organize. They also opposed dues assessments to fight the CIO and disagreed with the ILA's hostility to minimum wage laws, social security, and unemployment insurance. Radicals like Harry Bridges and others had established themselves not only as workers' leaders, but also led attacks on Jim Crow racism in the ranks and in the industry. The success of the 1934 strike was due in part to the welcoming of blacks into the ranks of the union. In his book, Workers on the Waterfront, historian Bruce Nelson notes that, quote, the ILWU's well-known opposition to racial discrimination was an important factor in the union's expansion into Hawaii, not only on the waterfront, but among sugar and pineapple plantation workers. The triumph of the ILWU in Hawaiian agriculture brought about a degree of fraternization across racial lines that few had thought possible. Since then, the union has beat back numerous Taft-Hartley and McCarthy-era attacks. More recently, the ILWU has 
has been in the forefront of broader social justice struggles, leading walkouts and work stoppages for various political causes. Today, it represents close to 60,000 workers, including those locals that initially refused to affiliate. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So tragically, four years ago this week, uh, you had the, the, the big white supremacy rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, the, the crazy people with their torches and their uh, their their hate rhetoric. Uh, Heather Heyer was murdered by, by a guy driving his car into a crowd. And you go, why? Exactly why? Sad reality. A lot of people that I know think oh, that that's just back then everything's fine now all of that kind of stuff has been been pushed aside because maybe we don't see enough of it on the evening news or because joe biden has done a really good job of cooling down the temperature uh, but here to share some thoughts on the fourth anniversary of the unite the right rally and the horrible tragedy that came out of that i've got our all-star panel uh, scott dworkin of the democratic coalition rich ojeda a uh, national spokesperson for no dems left behind and lauren windsor executive producer of the undercut undercurrent uh, guys thanks for sticking around i won't so let's start with you scott because i know you had the opportunity uh to interview heather Heyer's mother uh, after this this tragedy uh thoughts yeah, uh, Susan uh, is a really great voice for her daughter. Um, you know, she doesn't want to be remembered as a person who, um, or her mom speaking for her, has, has said that she doesn't want her, Heather Heyer to be a person who's remembered um, just for this because she encompassed so many things. But um, the things she was striving for was equality and equity for everybody. Um, it really was, it was uh, shortly after, I think, think uh, and uh, it was still fresh and, and uh, her uh, mom was in her car when we were uh, actually talking and we had a conversation and she still was uh, obviously broken up about it. Um, she gave a speech, I believe today, um, where she's more sounding like an activist and uh, it really taking from her daughter's reins and, and really speaking out. Um, you, you know, making it clear she had she was marching for black lives, um, even as a white woman. Um, so I, I think it's just it's a really tough uh, situation because, you know, I I was one of the people who encouraged people to counter protest there. Um, and and, you know, it, it's you never want anyone to be hurt like that on any side. Um, I think the response to that. I think she really ignited a movement um, and she really, uh, the, the rebuttal and reaction from people really was astounding. Um, so I think that Heather Heyer, you know, I th think we honor her memory by fighting uh, for this equality and equity. And I, I think that her mom would be proud of the efforts so far. We have a lot of ways to go, but it's still, I think it really honors her, uh, you know, as much as we can up to, up to now. But Trump losing is the biggest way to honor her. No, absolutely. And not just losing, but eventually I'd like to see him held accountable, maybe in, a, in an orange jumpsuit to, to, to match the skin uh, so that we put him away for a while. I'd love to see that. Still don't think it's going to happen, uh, but I would love to see it. Lauren, I wanted to get your thoughts uh, because, you know, one of the things that a lot of people have told me is, you know, it was that day where they realized maybe we are, maybe we do have a serious uh, white supremacy, racist problem in this country. Uh, my fear is a lot of people thinking now that, that we've got Biden in, in the White House, that things are, well, things are better. Uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, I think th that, uh, you know, there's general sentiment that things are better. But I mean, you know, just listening to the news in the past few days uh, of, you know, um, expect political violence to occur because of you know the former guy uh you know it, the he may be off twitter he may be uh off facebook but he's still issuing press releases and stoking um you know this disinformation about the 2020 election and um i think that most people still don't feel like the threat has gone away and certainly you know i mean all of us are you know white people so I, I, I will say that I, I imagine that, uh, 
you know, non-white people are still pretty scared. Yeah, especially since I would argue a lot of them are now in Congress. I mean, you look at Marjorie Taylor Greene, you look at uh, the gun nut from Colorado, Boebert, uh, and that Cawthorn guy. I mean, uh, it seems like we've taken them from, you know, from, you know, carrying the tiki torches to now walking through the halls of Congress. Rich, you, you, you want to jump in? Well, you know, I mean, it, it's really sad when you think about it. You know, when President Obama was elected, it was kind of like, hey, maybe we've rounded the curve on this. And then he won re-election. And, and I believe a lot of people was like, yeah, we've made it. We finally got to a point where, you know, we, we, we can say we're no longer, you know, full of a bunch of racist jackaloons. And then all of a sudden, President Trump comes on board. And, you know, he made America hate again. And that's exactly what he did. And it just it is it's absolutely sickening with the things that we see and how even today, still, after he has lost his election, we still have so much stuff going on in this country that's potentially dangerous. I mean, you know, tomorrow is is August the 13th. Tomorrow is the day that he's supposed to be, you know, placed back in office. And, and that's not going to happen. But make no mistake about it. There are people out there that believe in this. I mean, it, and, and when you live in certain areas that are that are deep red, like I live, I'm looking at these people around here and, and they believe this. No, no, I, I know people who, like you, they believe he's going to be reinstalled. But I, I do believe tomorrow has been pushed off until September. Yeah, they're, they're, they're saying now September. It's going to go from September to November. Look, the thing about it is, is he's not coming back. He's not going to come back. But these people, the sad part about it is, is that, number one, our country is allowing him to fleece the poorly educated because those are the people that are giving him their money. And that right there should be stopped. You know, and, and number two, I mean, it, it continues to poison the minds of people all across this country. I mean, the things that are going on, you know, and it's not just Trump, it's the QAnon. I mean, we just had a man take his two children across the border and murder them because he feared that they had serpent DNA. I mean, there comes a time where we need to take a stand in this country and we have to do something to deal with these people who are targeting the poorly educated. And then we got to look at our education system. Because goodness gracious, we got to teach people how to, you know, critical thinking around this tag on place. Because it's amazing that we're in the middle of a global pandemic that is killing millions of people, and we just crossed the fifty percent mark in vaccinations in this country. Sad, it, better than it, this. absolutely sad. But you know, in looking at you know the possibility of Trump being reinstalled, uh, I'm looking at the other side of this. And Jeffrey Rosen, the ex acting attorney general, uh, evidently testified for for seven hours. They now have you know notes of someone saying uh, Trump told him just just make a statement and we'll take care of the rest. There was a coup attempt. There's no question about that at this moment. Uh, and I, I'm. I want to believe there's something going on at DOJ. And Scott, you always tell me that there's something. Uh, tell me there's something more. Yeah, there is something more. I think that you're going to see uh, conspiracy charges against uh, people who are staffers and possibly members of Congress. I'm not sure the, the extent of that and how much of that is blown out of proportion. Um, but I, I, do, I do think that there was a lot of planning. Now, he, here's the thing. Whether or not person like Marjorie Taylor Greene knew or wanted it to become violent, that's really not the point, because this is what happened. You're in the car, you know what I mean? You're, you were part of the robbery. Um, so I, I, I think that they're in for a, a lot of hurt because they're, they already have cell phone records from members yeah. of Congress. Um, they're already getting testimony from whistleblowers. They're already uh, so many investigations. I know that there's at least three other uh, subcommittee investigations into um, the January 6th attack on top of the select committee, uh, on top of oversight. And uh, I think there's one other committee, maybe judiciary, I can't remember, um, but it, it's still pushing back. And I think, you know, they're gonna do everything they can to discredit that. And, you know, the, the next thing that they're gonna do, Rich is right about this, Donald is still trying to divide us. And here's the, the, the trick of the Ashley Babbitt shooting that they're going to try and use. The officer is black. The officer who shot Ashley Babbitt is black. And they're going to make this a divisive issue about race. They're going to try and distract for, from all of it and try and act like she's a hero. This is a domestic terrorist who was in a hallway. And one of the questions I ask everybody 
and, and this is kind of like sums it all up is Ashley Babbitt's crawling through that window. There's one person who is a police officer uh, uh, in between them in the hallway where members of Congress are being rushed out. What was her plan in that hallway? You have to assume that her plan was to kill them. If if that officer did not pull the trigger, I assume that the tactical team that was behind them would have opened fired on these people. And so you'd have more dead. So there was a decision that was made uh, that I guess kind of quelled the event. And it, as I talked to one of the officers who, who was there and he testified as well, um, you know, it, it's clear that it was, he, he's already been cleared by DOJ. Long story short, I think that we have a, a lot more planning than we ever thought. And, and I think that uh, that's all gonna unravel in court and, and also become public. That, I, I mean, there's been a lot of things that have been dug up that I never expected them to be smart enough to find out. And uh, I think also we have to keep in mind how corrupt uh, Donald made the DOJ. And so they have to do two investigations at once, the January 6th and then everything internally at DOJ and then watchdogs are investigating them as well. So it's a, there's a lot going on at once. Let, let me jump in here real quick also and just say that, you know, to me, the phone records, especially Donald Trump's phone records on the 6th, we already know that Jim Jordan has basically admitted that he spoke to Donald Trump. And of course, he didn't want to say when, but now that right there tells me that it was probably in the midst of all of this. And, and that's the kind of stuff that we need to know. I want to know who all he spoke with. Uh, and and, and, and I, I want to see. I know it's easy for us to say, well, I, don't, I doubt anything happens. But there comes a time when something has to happen. Because let me tell you, you know, they failed in, on this attempt. If we don't do something to make people realize that that's something that you better not even try, they'll try it again. Yep. You know, these people are dangerous. Are these sure? QAnon people, dangerous. Trump spoke with Tommy Tupperville, with Senator Tupperville, when he was uh, on the floor. I think he um, called Mike Lee, and Mike Lee handed him the phone. Um, I was in Georgia for the Senate runoffs and uh, reported, uh, was the first to report that Tupperville was, you know, going to uh, challenge the Electoral College. And, you know, as soon as we put that out, um, you know, Trump publicly started pressuring Tupperville to, uh, to do just that. And the same with David Perdue when we broke uh, a scoop on David Perdue on the same thing. And that all led into, it was kind of a snowball thing. Um, you know, you have Tuberville saying it and then Perdue saying it and then Holly and, and Cruz jumping into the fray. But Tuberville was like the, the first senator to, you know, come out and, and you know, imply that he was going to do it. And so then he became like a key figure in all of this. No, and you got to remember too that like he's the senator from Alabama. Mo Brooks was the leading the charge in the House, yeah. and so you you really have like you know Alabama being sort of the the home of the you know insurrection. Yeah, the ground zero. But you know, uh, Tupperville was only in the Senate a couple of days at that point. Uh, so to me, this is all stuff that you know there there's the the appearance of a quid pro quo of his endorsement and all of this stuff because i i've been saying for the longest time all of this stuff has been gamed out uh all of this stuff i believe was gamed out in 2015 uh that they wanted to pull in 2016 uh, when the election happened and when he won holy cripe uh you know they saved it until the next one to me this stuff has been things that have been banging around in the in the far right um, you know, wet dreams for, for so long, uh, they finally got a chance to try it. Well, you know, that Stop the Steal, you know, it wasn't just some, uh, you know, uh, new thing in 2020. This was something that was Roger Stone's uh, project in 2016, 2015, because they anticipated that, you know, uh, Hillary, Hillary was going to win. And we also know that two years before Trump lost his second, you know, race, uh, that was one of their plans that they said that if he doesn't win in 2020, we're immediately going to start screaming that it was a fraud. Yeah. Uh, now, my problem with all of this is the Democrats seem to have taken a little too, little longer than I wanted. Uh, I wanted think I want things to move faster. I'm an American. Damn it, things need to be quick. Uh, we need to wrap things up in one neat little hour, uh, so just like on TV. Um, because look, they're actually going to 
be able, I think they're going to be able to, with a large percentage of the population, to turn this Ashley Babbitt into a into a martyr, when the reality is we know who killed Ashley Babbitt. It was Donald Trump. It was Don Jr. It was Mo Brooks. It was Fox News, Mac, Newsmax, OAN. It was all of them. Uh, that I want them hold, held accountable. Tell everybody I killed her. I don't give a crap. Rich is taking 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 the the responsibility. Look, I, I don't care. I, I don't care. I, th I think this is absolute garbage. And and you know she was a you know first off I'm a veteran. She spent 14 years in the Air Force, you know, and she served in Iraq. But the moment that she started falling into this queuing on garbage and spewing that crap and then assaulting our capital, she lost that right. She is a treasonous traitor that got what she deserved because that police officer could not allow her to get through that window. And that's exactly the way that it is. And I don't care what anybody else has to say. That's how it is. Yeah. Now, as a veteran, I mean, as someone who spent as much time in, in the military as you have, uh, there's a lot of conversation around that. Maybe the military has gotten uh, a bit extreme and a lot of this extremism is festered in the military. Is that, is that your experience? I, I, it's not, you know, it's, it's not. The military is a phenomenal institution you know, uh, obviously, you're always going to have onesies and twosies that do the wrong thing. But for the most part, that's not how it works. You know, I, I don't care, you know, in a combat zone, it's all about the person to your left and your right. And you don't care who they are, where they're from. It doesn't matter. When bullets are flying, as long as they got your right and they got your left, you're good to go. So, uh, and, and that's how it is. We get a, we get along fine in the military. So all these people who dress up in, in military costumes and, and march they're around. They're a bunch of LARPers. They're a bunch of LARPers is what they are. If they were so damn tough and they wanted to be such such tough guys, where were they in 2004, 2005 when we were bogged down in Iraq and we needed people? No, they were at home. They don't have the guts to do what we do. They're all a bunch of plays. They, you know, they're compensating for what they're lacking in other areas. Anyone, anyone want to add in on that? I could. I could. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going. You can go. You, you go, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, we know where they're lacking. You know, they're, they're very, they're lacking. I don't want to say any more. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get you. He's a gentleman. Do what? I said he's a gentleman. He's not going to say. Yeah. They've got big pickers. It's the first time I've been called that. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. No, but the, the sad thing is, is, you know, and the point I want to make in this, and before we wrap this segment up is, uh, you know, I know so many of these militia types uh, who they've, they've kind of gone back underground for now, uh, but they are organizing. And my fear is, is that, you know, come next year, uh, we're going to see the same kind of insanity that we saw four years ago this week. Let me tell you something. First and foremost, the majority of those people out there that are running their pie holes, they served, the ones that served in the military made it to the ripe old rank of E3. They've never known what real leadership is, and that's just how it is. And I'm going to tell you right now, the last thing you want to do, the last thing you want to do is start something that you ain't going to be able to finish. Because if this stuff goes on and these people start doing the continue, let me tell you something. It would be nothing. It would be nothing for General Milley to start allowing us to do what we do. Our troops are coming home now. You know, why don't we go ahead and assign the 82nd Airborne Division to all the KKK organizations out there across the country? Let's give the daggone neo-Nazis to the 2nd Ranger Battalion. You know, let's do that. Let's play that game. Because make no mistake about it, that's something we could all sink our teeth into. Yeah, well, that, that, that would be an interesting discussion for another day. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, on the other side of this, going to talk a little bit about how the virus is raging out of control uh, and some of the insanity going on down in the, well, the two states, Texas and Florida. Quick break, right back. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. Rick Smith. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1894. That was the day that federal troops pushed Kelly's Industrial Army out of Washington, D.C. and across the Potomac River. The army was a group of unemployed men who had come to the nation's capital to protest government inaction. The country was in the grip of an economic depression. The nation's agricultural regions in the South and Great Plains were also hit by a drought. Times were hard for American workers and families. 
the call had gone out across the nation for the unemployed to make their way to the doorstep of Congress. The goal was to petition for public infrastructure projects to put people back to work. Businessman Jacob Coxey had organized a march of the unemployed from Ohio. Charles T. Kelly and his group came from California. They rode the rails and made it to Des Moines, Iowa, where they encamped. After a while, the local residents decided the unemployed group had outstayed their welcome. The Iowans provided lumber so the industrial army could build flatboats and be on their way. By the time Charles Kelly and his men made it to D.C., Coxey had already been sentenced to 20 days in jail for trespassing on the Capitol lawn. Yet unemployed men from across the country kept coming into the nation's capital. 1,200 men arrived from different points across the country. One of those in Kelly's group was a young author by the name of Jack London. London wrote of his experience, quote, across the wild and woolly west, clear from California, General Kelly and his heroes captured trains, but they fell down when they crossed the Missouri and went up against the effete east. The marchers' protests earned no help from Congress. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So as we see the stories coming out about the virus and this massive spread that's going on, I got to tell you, I think it's time to stop being nice. Uh, I think it's st- time to stop caring about the dim. Uh, I think we need to, to thin the herd, get rid of some of them. Uh, but the weird thing is, is the people who, sc- who usually scream the loudest about participation trophies and, and unearned self-esteem, uh, they're the ones who right now are invading our school board meetings. Uh, basically the illegitimate spawn of the Tea Party. Uh, loud, obnoxious, moronic. Uh, just and led by an angry mob of zombie Karens uh, who are bound and determined to ensure that our kids are not safe because their little precious can't smell his own breath. Uh, it's, it's crazy. And their argument is we, we should get the virus like our grandparents did. Uh, sad, sad stuff. And now we look at what's going on down in Texas and in Florida. 40% of all new COVID hospitalizations in those two states. Mississippi has announced uh, within a couple of days, no more health care facility. Everything's going to break down. There's going to be no availability left because they're that, they're that, they're that underwater in this. And we're just at the beginning. It's going to get worse. And here to share some thoughts on where we are, where we need to go, and what's going on. Uh, Laura Windsor, executive producer of the Undercurrent. Uh, Scott Dworkin. Uh, co- co-founder of the Democratic Coalition and Rich Ojeda, national spokesperson, no Dem left behind. Uh, Lauren, let's start with you. Forty uh, percent just in Texas and Florida alone. Uh, it's and it's going to get worse. Uh, how much worse do you think it gets? Well, I mean, I was just in Austin uh, in Houston for the past like uh, week or so, and it's crazy. Um, you have governor Abbott, uh, banning mask mandates, but then at the same time, he is, you know, issuing pleas for, uh, nurses to come, uh, into the state because they're running out of, um, they're running out of nurses. So, um, I think that they're on track to, you know, be in the same shape as Mississippi that, you know, they're going to have to call for federal help and, uh, you know, be setting up, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw the segment last night on uh, Rachel Maddow, but in Mississippi, they're, you know, setting up a field hospital in a parking garage. And I cannot imagine what that's going to be like in Texas, setting up field hospitals in parking garages in in the heat wave that's currently uh, taken over uh, much of the country. Uh, I, I, What's it going to be like to be somebody with COVID out in a, a garage where the heat temperatures are probably like 95 degrees? With the humidity of a Mississippi or, or a Texas, I I yeah. can't imagine. And again, this is one of those things I look at it. This was preventable in my view. Had we just had decent leadership and I and on a certain level, I give Asa Hutchinson uh, in Arkansas a, little, a, a minor bit of credit for going. Yeah, I was wrong. Uh, I at least he's admitting it. Didn't do anything yeah. yet to, to, to change it, but at least he admitted he was wrong. 
unlike the guy in Florida who didn't even acknowledge uh, that more ventilators were were sent in by the feds. And oh, by the way, they bought a couple of uh, uh, a couple of brand new mor- mobile morgues, uh, basically refrigerated trailers to drive around and pick up dead people. It's nuts. Well, DeSantis, or DeSantis as he's called, I mean, hundreds of ventilators were sent to Florida. Yes, they were requested by local entities and counties, um, but he acted like he didn't know about it. And I, I mean, if he didn't know about it, he should really resign because he doesn't know about millions of dollars worth of medical equipment that's going to save lives coming into Florida via the federal government is insane. Like, it doesn't make any sense. So him playing coy, like, oh, well, we didn't request that. Oh, it had nothing to do with us. It's like, why don't you want that? Why don't you just say thank you? Why don't you just, uh, what I thought was really cool about it is that Biden played no politics. He didn't question anything. He didn't tout it till till maybe afterwards. But like, he, he, he just sent him. Like, no questions asked. Like, you need him, you, you requested him, you got him. And now DeSantis is talking in a way, too. He, he's acting like, oh, well, we don't really need those. Those are extra. Those are for the people who will be on them eventually. And he acts like this is a part of, it's going to be a part of our normal life. This is how it is now. Like, I, and it just doesn't make any sense because he's not doing anything. If you wanted to try, if you wanted to really try to kill your own people, this is exactly how you do it. The DeSantis playbook is how you kill the most people via this pandemic as you can. Let me let me say, you know, I'm not again, I'm, I mean, I'm not for what took place on January the 6th. But I'm going to tell you right now, I can't believe people in Florida and people in Texas aren't thinking about doing that to their state capitals because their leaders are killing their own people. The children wards are absolutely full. And once again, they say by Labor Day, it's going to be three times as bad. And that's going to be all over. It's going to get to the point where when you show up at the hospital, they're going to say, go home and good luck. And I'll tell you what's really messed up is a person who got vaccinated and wore their mask and did everything in their power. If they get sick and they show up at the hospital, that needs to be part of the the, the questions because they should be allowed to kick somebody off of a ventilator who refused to do anything and just wanted to just say, we don't want to wear our mask. We saw a woman at a school board hearing, basically in tears saying, my daughter's face is beautiful and she don't need to cover it up. Well, how are you gonna feel when that face is ice cold because your daughter has been embalmed and you're in a daggone funeral parlor? I mean, the, the stupidity that is coming from this is showing us how stupid this country really is. We've really got to do something with our education system because we've got to stop just teaching the exam but because Rich, it's failing us. But Rich, you know, I, I, I've i made this argument to people as well, and they come back with, but, you know, 99.9% of the people survive, Rich. Really? So, so, so let's talk about 630 plus thousand Americans. And oh, by the way, it's going to be worse. You know, Delta variant is COVID on steroids. And these people that are getting it now, this Delta, it's killing them. And let me tell you something, we haven't even seen the death toll that we're about to go into. And, 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 and like they said, it's going to be three times as bad by the time Labor Day gets here. And already the hospitals are filled up. Already places have ran out of ventilators. I have a young family member that works in a hospital and she is monitoring television screens and each television screen is a person who is on a ventilator. She's monitoring over 80 different screens. Wow. That's and, and, and it's and every day they're losing more and more people. And the biggest shame. the biggest concern in all of this was the healthcare system. I mean, this was what we were supposed to be flattening the curve for uh, during the beginning of this, and we did. Uh, we did a pretty decent job of of not overrunning our healthcare system. But when you see Mississippi saying we're done, it's not long before Florida and Texas uh, and and other states, um, uh, there's nothing good here. Scott, yeah. you want to jump in? The, the the key here is. Not only are they going to be behind on vaccinations and possibly booster shots, but the Delta variant is not the only variant, and it's not going to be the only variant. No. Um, based on historical references or whatnot, you can assume that the worst variant is ain't here yet, um, and that that's usually the ones that kill children. Um, and so, obviously, Delta is on steroids, but 
uh, I would assume that we, we should expect for the worst. And so then we're going to be stacked against everybody who's vaccinated and then we get a different vaccination or we get booster shots and people will be so far behind. We'll have to develop new medicine. And like, I, I don't know what their plan is because we cannot crawl out of this without their help. And eventually the vaccinations that we have most likely will not be effective uh, against other variants. And so we'll just end up getting sick. Like it's just a cyclical thing. So we got to put an end to it. And I think this is the time where government steps up and they just make the really simple decision of like, you know, vaccines are mandated or you can't be a part of society, period. Now, now real quick, what Scott's saying, now, isn't it true that when people do not get vaccinated and they don't wear masks, that's how this continues to mutate into something bigger? And that's I, what I feel is it, it could happen and, and it's going to be far worse than the Delta variant. I think you're spot on like that, but that's because people refuse to get vaccinated and won't wear masks. Well, that's exactly what Fauci said this week. He's, you know, that if we continue to let the virus live, you know, by making our bodies available as hosts, it continues to evolve and mutate. And so it has to, we have to clamp down on the spread of the virus so that it doesn't have a host. Like it needs to, it, the more that it spreads, the more out of control it is. It, it's just going to spiral out of control. Like how do we ever. And that's the thing that gets me and what I'm watching. And, and I'll be honest, I have watched the, uh, the zombie Karens uh, screaming and stomping their feet and being angry with their cute signs. I've enjoyed some of the scenery. I thought it was funny on a certain level, but also sad uh, that these are people who probably barely you know, got out of high school biology. And, you know, in this country, you need a license to get a dog. But evidently, these people decided to reproduce and have children. And they don't care. They don't seem to care about those kids. That's the thing that gets me. And that's the thing I think I struggle with the most. And they don't care about my kids. Uh, again, something I'm struggling with. These vaccine Karens are, though, are probably the same ones that, you know, uh, were willing to take any drug in high school and, you know, uh, drink whatever drink that's like thrust into their hands out at a bar. I mean, it's just kind of ridiculous. Like if you're shooting Botox in your face, vaccine Karen, like, <laughs> you know, the, the vaccine is not going to hurt you. Like You shoot poison in your face, but like you won't, you know, take a vaccine in your arm. Right. OK. Yeah, I, I saw the same thing similar. Somebody posted. They said, you know, WVU fans will go to a tailgate party and drink anything anybody has in a cup but yet going to stand here and scream that they're not going to get vaccinated because they don't trust what's in it. Or, or out of that jug. I, I drank something out of a mason jar once that I'm still, I've still got problems with. I got a couple over here. <laughs> One of my friends who's a doctor in Michigan has said that it's spun out of control where people don't recognize that they actually have, it's kind of like an addiction, an addiction to denying the truth. And so they get into the hospital bed and that's when they're asking for the vaccine. Not one person has an ask for it. Every single patient of his who's contracted the virus, who's in the hospital is begging for the vaccine. And it, it's the last thing, it's the last thing that people are asking for before they put on a ventilator is always the last thing. And, and, what, and again, this is where I come back to. Uh, what do you think the vaccine is going to do for you at that point? I think they're going to cure it or like they, like they hope that it'll make it go away. Like it's going to be NyQuil or something like that um, when it's actually got to be in your system in order to fight it. And so it's, it's basic science, but maybe we need to re-explain that. I was willing to call this the Trump vaccine. I don't care what it is. If it's the Obama virus and the Trump vaccine, whatever you need to call things, I, I, I don't care about the framing. Uh, and it's just, it's just, there's nothing apparently with kids dying now and being hospitalized, there's nothing that will, will change. They're just gonna, you know, walk off the ledge here. I, I don't understand why. And I've talked to a lot of people who are unvaccinated and they don't have any reason. And guess what answer I get every time? Fox News talking point, Fox News talking point. Like every single time they have no valid reason. And when we get through those, they kind of feel ashamed of themselves and they hang up the phone. Like it really, that's how it ends up. And so it, it the propaganda has been so bad. It's an example of, of how we need to change the laws in this country to make it illegal, to make these kind of lies, like yelling fire and try to move. 
there's a crazy cognitive dissonance here because all these same people who are screaming about the vaccine being, uh, you know, microchipping your arm, you know, are screaming about, uh, you know, Trump should get all the credit for developing the vaccine. But I'm not going to take it. Hell if I'm going to put that in my arm. But that might be the reverse psychology. Let's go ahead and call it the Trump vaccine and then let these people show up and get their daggone shots because that's probably the only way they're going to do it. Or they're going to die. And then in 2022, if we have a blue wave, we could say we thought it was going to be, you know, losing the house. But instead, they killed their own people off. See, my problem is, is the people that are, the, the medical experts that I've talked to uh, said, we're, sadly, we're not going to kill enough of them off. Uh, because we do such a good job of keeping them alive, but they're going to have long-term health problems yes. that we're going to end up having to pay for. And and from what I've been what I've been told, long COVID is not something that you want to have, uh, because now you're talking about the kind of uh, of ailment that is a long-term chronic ailment that we, the taxpayers, that we, the people who are paying for insurance, are absolutely going to get stuck foot in the bill. And but and that's again, messed up. That's messed up. The truth is, is that that should be one of the first things. Insurance companies, if, if, if you burn down your house, you know, they have the right to tell you, I'm sorry, no. I think they should be asking these people right off the bat, were you vaccinated? Because if not, the vaccines were free and they were available. You chose not to get them. I would say insurance companies should tell these people, tough, I'm sorry, we're not going to help you. And I don't think we should have to pick up their daggone uh, slack. So I want to get your thoughts on Ohio Congressman Warren Davidson, who tweeted out uh, overreaching governments and corporations won't stop trying to impose critical health theory on Americans. Uh, that's why we need my vaccine passport Pre prevention act now more than ever. Uh, I got to ask, is there is there any end to the propaganda? Because, you know, now critical health theory, you know, black people and immigrants are, are causing it to spread is going to be the now the now buzzword. Sad. Davidson. Hey, hey, Rep. Davidson. Shut up. <laughs> be quiet. No one cares what you have to say. You're a loser. You need to go away. You have he's no he's going to raise a ton of money off of this. You know, that's going to happen. <laughs> insane because we have we have vaccine passports what do you have to do to get you want to go go to africa you have to get vaccinations what, what are you talking like it doesn't make any sense even our troops 17 vaccinations this will be their 18th one on their vaccination card on average there's 17 vaccinations you have to be in a troop that goes maybe to the middle east or elsewhere and you so should have seen the yeah. daggone lines i've been a part of where both sleeves are up and you got one cheek sticking out and they're popping you with everything and anything you can get and even I've Ted Cruz had to have papers. And even yeah. Ted Cruz, when he went to Cancun, had to have papers. Passports, does, I mean, like, it's just another catchphrase. And, they're, you know, th this is a time for us to be, like, tough. Deal with it. This is how it is. This is how it's going to be. We don't care about your anti-science, jarled mind. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any logic. And we just have to say no. Like, this is like dealing with a toddler. You know, you just have to kind of put the balloons around them or whatever and confine them to the area. If they're going to keep on reaching for the knives on the kitchen counter, you have to stop them. Like they don't know better for their own, their own selves. We can't just let them commit suicide. I'm right there with you us all as well. Uh, most certainly something we, we have to, uh, like I said, I, I'd like to see most of them go. Sadly, not enough of them will. Uh, sad stuff. But guys, I appreciate you taking time, sharing your thoughts and your expertise on our topics of the week. Uh, Lauren, thanks so much. Rich, uh, Scott, thanks so much. I hope you guys will come back and share some more down the road. Uh, thanks again. Hey, Hi guys. Thank you. Uh, good stuff. Uh, now, the question that I have, folks, you know, should we should we be holding these people accountable? Should we do as, as Rich has said? The heck with you. You didn't have it? Sorry. Uh, go home and take care of it. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Uh, any topics you want to hear, any any guests you want to have uh, on our panel, by all means, reach out to us here at the program. Um, uh, lots, lots of fun ahead. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you back here next time.
You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick. Email Rick. At Rick at the Ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. It's time for The Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is The Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here. Today on the big program, lots to get to, lots to talk about. Let's start off with the big headline of the day. Uh, New York Governor Mario Cuomo, not Mario, Andrew Cuomo. What am I, we got Mario on the mind. Andrew Cuomo, uh, out. Don't care. Uh, I was never a Cuomo fan to begin with. Uh, let's hope his replacement does some positive things for the working people of New York uh, that, that Andrew didn't. Uh, hopefully move the state forward, uh, hopefully do some good things. Uh, I'm ready to be done with the past and move on to the future so we can actually get some stuff done. Again, back to the frame, getting things done. But I do find it interesting, very interesting, that you still got Matt Gates in Congress. You still got Donald Trump, who's the, the most favored of the GOP. Uh, I think you got to weigh uh, which, side, uh, which side cares about treatment in the workplace. Um, I'm glad he's gone. Bye. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, other big news today. The Senate, holy shnikes, did its job. Today, the Senate, <laughs> I know, I know, uh, did its job. 69 to 30. Uh, yes, you had 19 Republicans joining with all the Democrats to move forward on the $1.2 trillion investment in our nation. Uh, and it was called, aptly, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Pretty simple. We didn't even need one of those cute little acronyms that they like to come up with. It's just the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Because I guess it's, it's so rare that there's some bipartisanship that we can celebrate uh, that it is there. Now, as I said, you know, this is going to hopefully... Hopefully move us in the direction that we start rebuilding some stuff, doing some good stuff there. Uh, I do find it interesting that yesterday's headline um, Reuters put out was GOP gives Trump credit for an infrastructure bill he opposes. <laughs> and and that, is, that is apt for today's Republican Party. Yes, this was all Donald Trump, but he's against it. <laughs> yes. Uh, he was going on the other day about how anybody who votes for this, anyone who gives Biden a win, it's over. Uh, well, they did, and good on them. Uh, as I said, uh, they, they got this through, the bipartisan part, almost immediately moving on to the other part, the $3.5 trillion human infrastructure budget plan that they're going to move forward on. Uh, I'm hoping it happens. Uh, we need investments in our environment. We need investments in housing and education and, and health care and, and senior care. Uh, we are getting older uh, and older quickly. And we're going to need to do something with people as they do get older. But this bipartisan bill, some good stuff in it. Look, I mean, uh, is it perfect? No, nothing's ever perfect. You're never getting perfect. Uh, let's stop with the I'm only going to get perfect. Never getting perfect. Uh, you know, as I've heard said before, there's only been one person who's ever been perfect and and they nailed him to a couple of pieces of wood. Uh, nobody's perfect. Nothing's perfect. This ain't perfect, uh, but it's a good start. Uh, as the, the White House has put out a, a one pager saying, look, this is going to create good jobs. It's going to good, good paying union jobs. Uh, they say, they're saying around two million jobs per year over the next decade. As we as we build more stuff, as things expand, uh, they're expecting two million jobs a year. Those jobs, especially the building jobs, uh, will be done under prevailing wage law, which means uh, local wage and hour conditions will not deteriorate. Uh, we are not going to have you know transient fly by night uh, contractors coming in doing shoddy work and then disappearing. You're going to actually support a local 
construction base. I am a big fan of prevailing wage laws uh, and project labor agreements. Uh, the hope is we get that done that way. Uh, they also talk, according to the White House's one pager, of growing uh, the clean energy sector and wages in the clean energy sector. You know, wind, uh, solar, carbon capture, and energy transmission stuff, uh, re rewiring our infrastructure, you know, the, the whole grid. If you remember, like I do, I go back to the, the campaign in 92 when Jerry Brown, who was running governor of California, was running for president. One of his platforms was to hire people to go restring every pole, every electric line in the country. They were going to restring. And the argument back then was some, some astronomical number, like 80 percent of the, the electricity was lost in transmission. And that if you could you know, make that more efficient, if you could save some of that from being lost, prices might come down. We'd have an abundance of energy. Uh, it would be a smart thing. And, and I agree. It would be a very smart thing, something maybe we should, maybe we should think about. Also, some, some EV cha charging stations on highways, in communities, in gas stations, getting people the ability to take those electric vehicles on the road. Uh, I think a smart, smart decision. Uh, also, one of my favorite parts of the uh, bipartisan plan is Buy American. Uh, the stuff that we're going to be rebuilding the country with, the you know, the iron, the steel, the uh, all of the manufactured products, all of the construction material, all made right here. I think that's important because while it's great having the, you know, the jobs of people putting stuff together, uh, the construction workers building the stuff, we need to have the jobs of people creating the, the materials to do that. And this bill, uh, this bill does this, as we found out. Evidently, 20% of our roads, this is the number they're saying, 20% 20, 20 of our roads are garbage. Uh, or as they say, in poor condition. Uh, that means about 173,000 miles of road. Uh, that's how much of that they are planning to repave uh, and to deal with 45,000 bridges. Uh, probably 5,000 of them right here in Pennsylvania where I'm at. Uh, so good stuff. They are, they're also talking about making massive uh, you know, contributions and massive investments in uh, transit workers and in public transit uh, and, and doing the things that, duh, we should have been doing all along. Uh, there's going to be a good bit of, bit of money for that. Uh, going to help the auto industry out because we're going to make um, electric vehicles here. And they're encouraging the supply chain. You know, you remember the automobile? Remember when all the parts were made here? Remember when Delphi was a massive company? Remember when you could get a, a, a car part that didn't suck out of the box? Uh, I have a friend who does uh, who does car work. And he says, you know, half the time you take a starter out of the box, it's junk out of the box. You got to go replace it two or three times just to get something to work because of the cheap garbage we're getting out of China. So really important to have local supply chains and one that I would argue would be maybe a little more more quality minded. Just a thought. Also going to invest in the areas around the country uh, that are the energy producers, coal and, and, and gas and all of that. Uh, they're talking about twenty one billion dollars in envio environmental remediation, uh, you know, Superfund sites and brownfields, uh, abandoned mines, those things. They're the cap. They're going to cap wells, all kinds of stuff to reclaim land that has been just well, dumped on uh, by the profiteers who have who have you know, passed on their external costs to us, the taxpayer. And, and if you want to get mad about that money, get mad at corporate America. And oh, by the way, deregulation. That's what's done that. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to see that. Maybe we take some of that reclaimed land. Maybe we clean it up and we build some decent housing for people. Just a thought. Uh, also, we're going to invest about $65 billion dollars uh, in our broadband access. Uh, Biden wanted 100 million. They scaled it down to 65. Can't do too much, evidently. Uh, now, I would love to have the kind of internet speeds that other countries have. Uh, and I would love to have their prices because ours are crazy expensive. Uh, I, pay, I pay more for, for, for high-speed broadband access than, than I've paid for, ever paid for a car payment. I mean, think about that. It's crazy. Uh, and one of my favorite ones, uh, pipe fitters. If, if now's the time, call up the pipe fitters union and say, I want to be a pipe fitter uh, because they're they're investing a ton of money in pipes. 
whether it's the gas lines that are going underneath you know, the ground. When I first moved to Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, like within a couple of weeks, a house literally just blew up. Somebody was digging in the backyard, hit a gas line, just boom. Uh, same thing. There was a nursing home, like a, a couple months later, a nursing home around the, the block, same thing. Boom, up goes this, this nursing home. Um, we need to protect our gas lines a little bit better, upgrade them. Um, that stuff hasn't been really dealt with in 100 years. Kind of time, kind of time. Also, our water pipes. Uh, we, we need massive investment in water infrastructure. And I know, like, when I moved uh, to the, the central PA area, Harrisburg was like the sinkhole capital of the world because the, the water lines underneath were all broken and uh, water was just eroding the underground. And you'd see every once in a while a garbage truck gets swallowed up or a bus or, you know, something. It was always a lot of fun. Uh, now we got the opportunity to upgrade and do that. Uh, but the pipes, kind of one of these moments that I go, pipes are a good idea. And it's something that I've been calling for for a long time. Because I saw this story uh, put out by the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. And according to them, uh, bottled water is like 3,500 times more harmful for the environment than tap water. Uh, and you go, wow, that's a huge number. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Just putting something in a bottle and shipping it across country, um, yeah, it's going to be worse for you. When I was a kid, you drank out of a garden hose. When I was a kid, there were there were drinking fountains literally everywhere. And I know some older people are going to tell me, yeah, they had drinking fountains, but they were one for whites and one for blacks. Right, I know. Now we can have one. Now we're big boys and girls. Uh, but we don't even have them anymore. Everything's gone to bottled water. So this study out of Spain... Uh, basically says, look, you know, everything that goes into bottling water, you know, making the bottles, manufacturing the bottles and, and, and you know, shipping them to di distribution, the transport, the usage, the disposal, the waste, all this stuff, uh, 3,500 times worse than the for the environment than just drinking water out of the, out of the tap. Uh, now, they looked at the, 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 population of Barcelona and said like 60% of the people there drink bottled water and you go wow so they they estimated what would happen if everybody the entire population switched to, to bottled water and what they came up with is it would cost like almost another 85 million dollars just for the raw materials to make the bottles and all this stuff and it would kill off almost another species in a half a year so ah, we don't need another yeah, it's, we got too many already we need bottled water. And I'm going, you know, I remember when bottled water first hit. I go, what a dumb idea. Who in their right mind would buy water when you can get it right out of the tap? And I remember the whole push to convince you that your tap water is bad. The lead pipes that we haven't fixed. And in some areas, tap water is bad. Evidently, Americans pur purchase about 15 billion gallons of bottled water each and every year. In fact, it's much it's more po popular now than soda is. Uh, soda has been plummeting. And it comes back to this mistrust because people think what they're drinking out of the bottle is better than what's in the tap. But, oh, no, uh, we don't know what's in that bottled water half the time. Half the time, and this is my favorite, although two big boys, the two big names, do you know what they put in the bottled water? Tap water. <laughs> You're literally buying tap water. Now, they do a little filtering it because the person who sold me our, our filtration system at our house, um, he, was, he was very proud of the fact that they, they actually built and sold one of the big, one of the big names, uh, their filtration system. Now, it's a much bigger system than mine. Same concept, but, you know, obviously much, much bigger. Um, it's just tap water. They're just literally taking city water, running it through a filter, putting it in a bottle, and charging you like two, three bucks for it. And we're buying it up because we've been told. We've been told that, you know, that tap water is bad for you. Only problem with that is in most places, in most places, the tap water is, is extremely regulated. It has to meet strict standards. In fact, we get... Uh, I, I see in the borough that we don't get city water. We we're st we still have well water. 
Um, but in the borough, they, they tell you what what's what's what. They tell you what the numbers are, the levels for this and that. They have to be they have to, to record all this stuff. Uh bottled water, not so much. And in fact, what they ended up finding in a lot of places, in, in you know, a number of the waters, and I, I'm thinking of a you know, one that begins with P, uh it's a, kind of a French name. That the one report said that they actually like found fecal matter. Uh, and look, if you're drinking, you know, honestly, if you're drinking the spring water right from the spring, probably a bunch of animals go in the bathroom in there. Wouldn't be surprising. But that evidently we've taken as it's, it's private. It must be better. And we've kind of in this weird way been trained like Pavlovian dogs to think anything done by the public, anything done by our government, anything done by us is somehow bad. But anything done by the profiteers, good. Except not. Now, for me, the message out of all of this and the reason I bring this up is because, you know, I, I want to do away with the bottled water. It's insane. We should ditch that immediately. We should build infrastructure across this country that makes our, our pipes better. Uh, we upgrade that uh, and we put, you know, drinking fountains everywhere like we used to have. I remember going to the park and playing basketball and there were there were drinking fountains, several of them. And they were free. And you know what we used to do? Because we, we didn't kind of want to suck out of the same tube as everybody else. We brought our own bottles. We didn't have bottles. We just brought cups. But same same idea. So use re reusable bottles. Um, you know, glass ones, preferably steel ones, probably get away from the plastic but rebuild the infrastructure. And oh, by the way, save yourself a ton of money. It's insane to me that we're buying water from some of these massive companies. It's amazing to me. And the guy who makes the cocoa mix, uh, Nestle, the largest water pimp in the, in the, in the world, their CEO once said that water isn't, 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 a, isn't a right which means you should have to buy it if you want to live. And what, what better profit motive than I have what you need to live? It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Uh, but like I said, I'm thrilled to see that we are going to get something. Uh, it's not perfect, not by any means, uh, but I think going to move us in the right direction, get us started. And then, um, you know, hopefully we get this other, this other half of it. Now, none of this stuff is done yet. Uh, this just got through the Senate, so I'm still happy, still guardedly optimistic that the House uh, isn't going to tank it because we got to get the other side done, too. But some good stuff so far. I'm uh, going to take a quick break. When we come back, Trey Crowder is going to be here to share some thoughts. The liberal redneck on what's going on down south and and around the, the southern area, especially around the vaccine. Quick break. Right back with Trey. Stick around. There's nothing more American than workers standing up And the union gives a voice to win On The Rick Smith Show Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So the fun continues in Florida as evidently uh, the Florida Department of Health and Human Services is asking for another 300 ventilators. Uh, evidently, their COVID numbers are going through the roof. In fact, I think it was almost 60,000 uh, new cases in the last two days. Uh, evident another story, they've bought some new uh, some new death trailers, some mobile morgues because they're anticipating a bunch more dead people that they can't possibly deal with. And you still got the governor going, hey, we're going to be fine. We're going to tough it right out. And if you if you school districts, if you wake those kids wear masks, we're not going to pay you. It's crazy. Just crazy what we're seeing down there. And here to share some thoughts on the insanity. I've asked Trey Crowder to come talk with us. Trey is a fabulous comedian. Also, the liberal net redneck. You make sure you check out his website, TreyCrowder.com, and also his YouTube page. Trey, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, Rick. Good to see you. Good to be back. So the, the Sunshine State is bringing in more mobile uh, death labs, and uh, mm -hmm. we need more ventilators. 
Yeah, no, I heard. Yeah, I heard you say that. You know, back in my day, a death trailer was one that got blown up by my uncle Bubbles while trying to make meth. You know, like this is whole new world we live in now. Like uh, death trailers, that's upsetting. <laughs> but here's the thing, and this is, and I think, it, and I feel horrible that I think this way, but I don't care. I know, I dude, honestly. I completely hear you and I'm with you on that. I like since the since the vaccines came out and since they reached a point, which this was months ago now, they reached a point where every adult in this country who, you know, wanted one could have gotten them both by that point. In my head, I got to a place where I was like, okay, so we're good to go then. You know what I mean? Meaning like you've had the choice to make, and if you're rolling the dice on it, then you've done that. But the rest of us need to be able to go back to live in our lives you know and i just can't have that much sympathy for them but the th but as is always the case with the world it makes it harder to be okay with things because i have i have children two boys eight and nine years old and as i understand it uh thanks to the delta variant and the great state of florida uh, it's not as much of a done deal as it used to be as far as kids being safe from this thing or whatnot which kind of changes the landscape a little bit these people's decisions are impacting our lives those of us who were responsible so you know it makes it a little more complicated than it should be but i but i but i hear you though i'm not too inclined to give a f myself no, no. Like you saw, there was the radio host down in Florida who, you know, he was a big anti-vaxxer, and on his deathbed, he's like, "Go get the vaccine." Well, too late, buddy. Uh, too late. And, and good, bye. And I feel yeah. terrible. I think that you know, some kind of karmic uh, penalty is coming for me. Something's going to be at the end going. You shouldn't have done that. Uh, but I still, I still, don't, I, I guess I don't care. Yeah, but the thing is, though, you do care. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you, the reason you don't care about that is because you do care about the general public at large and just us defeating this thing and making everyone's quality of life a little bit better. You care about that, which is why you don't care about that guy, you know? So if there is a karmic retribution waiting for you, then we're all in trouble, brother, me especially, because it's a much more uh, malevolent force waiting for us at the end of this ride than I have been bargaining on. <laughs> uh, that is the hope. Now, I, I, I saw your most recent video it made me laugh. Uh, as all of them do, and again, I hope folks will check out your YouTube page. You do incredible work. Uh, but you, you brought up this this question of, you know, how would the settlers how, think about, yeah. you know, you know, the, you know, their kids have been dying from, you know, all kinds right. of diseases that could be preventable, and they look at what, what, what would they say to us? Yeah, you think about like the pioneers and the settlers and everything, and they had to take their lives and the lives of other loved ones in their hands to pursue this better life, you know, and traverse the continent at a time when that was really difficult to do so. And they're all getting cholera and bit by snakes and all this other stuff and just dying in droves. And I feel like they had cholera and smallpox and typhoid and tuberculosis and all this other stuff. And if you went back then and told them, I feel like if you went back then and told them, hey, in the future, we will know how to combat things like that and we'll have very simple and efficacious measures in place to combat plagues but a huge chunk of the population will just choose not to do it i think all of those settlers most of whom couldn't read by the way would look at you and go are you serious right now why on earth would you not do please give me that what is this magic you have unfurled in the future, O oh Time Lord? Please share it with me so that I can save my family's life with it. And why in God's name are your future people refusing to partake in this? And yeah, I think that's what they would think. And again, they're not known for their intellectual capabilities, the settlers, yeah. you know? Yeah, you know, and, and neither are the people who haven't gotten the vaccine either. But but the good right. thing, I guess, I guess if there is a good thing that, you know, there are there are stupid people here, but there are stupid people all over the globe. I, I happen to see this story uh, from England where the a uh, bunch of anti-vaxxers uh, stormed the a BBC building. Only problem is they went to the wrong address. No, not the anti-vaxxers. What? <laughs> that doesn't sound like them to get a fundamental piece of information wrong. 
<laughs> and make a poor life choice based upon that. That that, that can't be right, Rick. Come on. I, I just had to laugh. But here's the weird thing. And you, you go back to what the settlers would think. You know, they didn't have Fox News. Uh, they didn't right. have a media culture that was it was going after them, feeding them BS. And my my favorite story of the day uh, came out of, you know, uh, Business Insider came out with a story because of the Dominion voting systems lawsuit. Mm -hmm. um, they they claimed that this OAN, this One American News, yeah. uh, they had a, uh, an expert mathematician on. Uh, they had this expert math mathematician on uh, to talk about the election. And he he came up with what was the he said the probability of Biden's victory in a country was one over 10 to an exponent so large that there's not enough stars in the universe. There aren't enough atoms in the universe to explain the number. Problem is, is when not pretending to be a mathematician on OAN, uh, this guy, what he does for a living, he sets up swing sets. Yeah, you know, I hadn't heard that particular story, and I had a feeling it might have an ending similar to the one that it had, because I was thinking, listening to it, like, you know, I could go on there and proclaim the exact opposite. You know, I saw a clip of Mike Lindell earlier from his big computer symposium he had or whatever, where he was like, he was flipping the states in real time. And literally all it was, he was just like, I turned this state a different color and it wasn't white, which is weird, but it's just <laughs> like, I'll change this state to a different color. See, Trump won and people are all clapping and la you know, and loving it and whatnot. And it's like, any anyone can say that. And see, that's the problem with this whole, group of people that buy into this stuff is it's like they're the ones who say to us do your research you know what i mean and it's like watching youtube with your mouth open ain't research you know like research is a whole different thing just say, but but it goes even farther than that because having a guy go on a network that proclaims itself to be a news network and say i'm a mathematician and they don't clarify oh actually he builds swing sets and then he says a bunch of math stuff you know, old people are going to believe that. And that's the problem with this information. They don't think about how easy it would be for me to go on there. I can't even bang, build swing sets, but I can make up a bunch of number <laughs> stuff if I wanted to. And know? that's the thing that gets me. And this is the problem with what's, what's wrong with our, our media culture at this moment. Uh, now, look, I guess, they, I guess right. they don't have the budget that Fox News has to go out and buy an actual mathemat mathematician to sell his soul and spew whatever they want. So they just grabbed a guy who makes swing sets. And that's seems to be okay i i i don't know where to go with that other than no i know no you're right what are we supposed to do with that because yes like you said it's like all that matters is you say the thing that uh the target demographic wants to hear you know so it doesn't matter that he's not an actual mathematician it doesn't matter that he's a swing set doctor or whatever he ain't even no he's a swing set <laughs> mister you know whatever but he goes on there and he says a bunch of number stuff <laughs> that aligns with the type of numbers they were wanting to be presented with and that's all that matters then you just go forward from there that makes those numbers true and that is the problem with our media today because we used it didn't used to be it really really didn't it used to be a time where like some things were true and some things were not you know some things happened and some things didn't but all that's just out the window now yeah. so but what even the math stuff, look, I'm not a mathematician. I'll be the first one to tell you that. But when I start hearing it's a, it's one over 10 to the exponent so large, there aren't enough stars in the universe. See, there are only so many voters in Georgia. It's right. it's a fairly right. small state. Well, no, well, that's how that see, that's why they're smart about the particular swing set man they pick out to pretend to be their number doctor is they get one that understands that you start throwing enough purported number facts out there and people are just like yeah probably you know <laughs> it's like, like i don't i don't know what all them numbers may again i'm on the other side and i hear all them numbers and my eyes start to glaze over and i'm like all right okay whatever i don't even know how to begin to discredit that because of how astronomically ludicrous it sounds you know so it's like you gotta you gotta gussy it all up with all these things that seem like facts, but are not, but they sound smart. That's the whole, that's the, like, that's the key to unlocking that whole side of things. It's like, yep. if you sound smart or you sound like what they think smart sounds like, you know, 
then you're good. Now, you're like good Michael Lindell. Go. I mean, perfect example. If you right. scream loud enough and you point your finger enough and you, people are going to be on that side are going to go, he must know what he's talking about. Right. I was going to say this guy's emphatic, but they don't know what emphatic means. But yes, it's like, oh, this guy's, this guy, this guy really knows what he's talking to. He, yeah, this guy's telling it like it is. You could tell by how his finger looks when he points it and screams, you know? So like, he must be telling the truth. Who, what kind of lunatic would do that and not be telling the truth, you know? And like, we're laughing at it, but that type of thing genuinely works on so many people, you know, like unironically that works on them. No. And, it, and, and what's, and I what's just really, don't, no, I'm with you. And what's frustrating know. about it is uh, we're all being robbed blind because there was a report report came out today and Hey, good on us. Congratulations for us. Uh, we now have a CEO class that uh, makes 351 times that of the average worker. They got a 19% raise in 2020. I was about to say, what is that up from 322, yep. you know, a couple months ago or yeah, whatever? Yeah. <laughs> we broke 350. Hooray for us. Yeah. Pat on us for, you know, taking the lower wages, working in dangerous conditions. Uh, good on us, man. Yeah. Yeah, no, that well, yeah, well, dude, it'll be it'll be four hundred and fifty one times in you know by Christmas. You know what I mean? It'll be six hundred and three times by the next uh, Memorial Day. I mean, that's just that's just what they do. Like they just accumulate that wet, like, and that's going to keep as long as they keep all the people who the as long as they keep their preponderance of people who are getting screwed over by that type of uh, culture as long as they're keeping them upset at made up space numbers about Trump's election results, you know, they're going to continue to get away with making more and more money off of their backs. And that's their, that's their whole deal. And that's the thing that is insane to me because most of the people I know who are the biggest Trump supporters, they're struggling. They really are struggling. They've been screwed right. by this economy and yet they are the most ardent Trump supporters. He, the billionaire con man from New York is their guy. That's the horse right. they're, they're backing. And it makes no sense to me. Yeah. That well, Yep. Yeah, because all that stuff is Joe Biden's fault, Rick. He just got here, but it's still his fault. That's the, like, Again, it goes back to the thing we're talking about, the problem with media and disinformation. There's almost nothing you can do in the face of that. I don't want to be apocalyptic about it, but like when the other side can just tell them what they want to hear and say, no, it isn't our fault. It's actually their fault. And they can just say whatever they want and truth doesn't matter and they're going to believe it. Then what are we supposed to do? Yeah, we're it's just those immigrants. stuck in this position. They're going to keep believing that, you know, like they can uh, – the other side will just take credit for whatever and their base will believe it. And here we are. Or they're just going to blame the immigrants, you know, that too. Yeah. I mean, right. it's, Apparently COVID is the immigrants fault and not even the Chinese immigrant hold the, 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 you know, the old school immigrants, the Mexican immigrants, the ones coming from down South. Yeah, I know that, that blows my, well, it, no, it doesn't. It doesn't blow my mind. It's completely, it completely tracks. It's very much par for the course. But yeah, all these governors who are making it almost illegal to not catch COVID in states like Texas and Florida and Louisiana are, are at the same time trying to say that it's actually illegal immigrants that are to blame for the COVID surges while they make it illegal to make people wear masks or get vaccinated or whatever. And And again, it's becoming the the like unofficial catchphrase of our people at this point in time, or at least this segment on the show right now, which is what are we supposed to do with that? You know what I mean? Like, it's so like, what do you even do? It's so far out there that like, you can call it stupid all the live long day, which I do. That's my whole job. And it's yours too. But like, where do we go from there, man? Yeah, no, like, look, I had a guy who was complaining that Obama had his 60th birthday party of all vaccinated people, and they were taking temperatures and trying to do what they can do, but was posting pictures about uh, Bike Week in Sturgis. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Basically the same thing. Obama's birthday party and Sturgis. <laughs> Mass, that Venn diagram is just two completely different circles. <laughs> but sure, let's uh, let's try to draw that parallel. No, yeah, it's crazy. I and I mean, you know, the thing that's interesting is, you know, we make fun of the South because it's so easy to do. It's so, buddy, it's the easiest. Oh, I know. I mean, we make it real easy. You know, I mean, first of all, just the way we say everything. 
just uh, makes it easy to make fun of. And that's fine. I get it. Hell, the, the thing is, I mean, dude, I do it too. I'll make fun of people for joke, making fun of our accent. But like, if I started to tell you a story about a real dumb person I saw on the news or something, they could be from Milwaukee. And when I got to the part of the story where I quoted that person, I would be like, yeah. And then he was like, bad, 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 bad. I'd start doing it in my accent, you know? And, and I'm a victim of that same stereotype and I do it. So, I mean, listen, man, I get it. We are easy. No, just because, you know, right <laughs> now right I'm there. looking at, I'm looking at where this next, these next waves coming, the next, the next spikes coming and you go, we've been telling you guys, why, right. why do we have to go through this? Yeah, no, I know. And, but it's like, but I also, I think about, like I made that video today talking about Greg Abbott and going in on it, but I uh, titled it, you know, Texans deserve better. Cause I do try to remind myself. Cause like I'm from Tennessee, man. Tennessee is like one of the worst of the worst right now, frankly. But it's like, I know cause I'm from there that there are so many people from there or still living there or both that are just as, upset by this more so upset by this stuff than everybody else is you know and i just try to keep them in mind because i know that they exist but i don't know how they're maintaining their sanity yeah in times like these. no they're good know? people they're good people in the south i've met you know hundreds of people that i know good people uh just surrounded by raving idiots uh the yes. liberal redneck yep. make sure you check out the website tradecrowder.com make sure you get to the youtube channel we'll get links out on how you can do that uh trey always fun talking with you man i appreciate the time yeah, Rick, always a pleasure. Thanks, man. I'll see you next time. Good stuff, man. Trey Crowder. Make sure you check out the website, TreyCrowder.com. Quick break. Right back. Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. Rick Smith. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I got an email the other day that, that you know, grabbed my attention. And again, you know, I get some really great stuff from our listeners. And for most of you, thank you. Uh, but this guy really, really unhappy with uh, President Biden's eviction moratorium. Uh, he declared in his email that President Biden extended the eviction moratorium. Him doing this is unconstitutional. I know it. You know it. He knows it. That I'm aiding and abetting a known criminal. I, I, I love my Trump supporters. Uh, and I thought kind of harsh. Uh, you find out later on that this guy's a renter uh, and, and he's behind on his rent as well. Very bizarre. Uh, but here to share some thoughts on maybe how... President Biden should have gone about uh, making sure people don't lose their homes in this moment. Maybe maybe Congress should have done something. Somebody uh, here to share some thoughts on that. I've asked Jamoa Lake to come talk with us. She She's senior policy analyst uh, at the Center for American Progress Poverty to Prosperity Program. Uh, Jamoa, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me. So we know now Donald, Tr D Donald Trump supporter thinks uh, Joe Biden's a criminal. Uh, he should have never done this. This is unconstitutional. It's all bad. Well, it's much more complicated than that. And it's so complicated that, you know, even experts are trying to figure out what is allowed to happen. But at the end of the day, it's the CDC that has enacted this uh, new slash extended eviction moratorium. And it's really under the pretense that an understanding that the spread of COVID-19 is again surging and that uh, recent research that's come out uh, multiple times this year has shown that preventing evictions also prevents the spread and death from COVID-19. So this is a public health emergency action um, and it's something that is well, well within the CDC's mandate to be able to uh, do it as they did last year. So why do, why, I, what I don't understand to start with is why the CDC is the one in charge of this. I'm of the mindset this is Congress's job. Uh, they should have done this before they bailed out of town. Uh, the, I guess the money's already been allocated. 
Uh, you know, in fact, we had Pennsylvania State Senator Art Haywood on uh, a week ago, and he said, look, the money's there. We're just having a hard time getting it out the door. So I, I don't get why these landlords and the, the these banking folks are in such a hurry to boot people to the curb when money's coming. Yeah, so it's, it's again, another complicated landscape thing, and there's just so many pieces there. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, some uh, corporate landlords especially don't really have um, household interests in mind, and sometimes it's more profitable for them to evict people rather than to keep people housed. But we know that keeping people housed keeps people healthy. It helps um, secure, uh, you know, financial stability. Um, and, you know, when it comes to who can do what, you know, a lot of places in the government can do a lot of things but yeah they they lost their chance to because of rules and regulations but at the end of the day it be kind of became a game where the responsibility of keeping people housed during the pandemic was pushed off to anybody else except oneself to the point where nothing was done we saw this multiple times last year renters are kept until the 11th hour until actions are taken to protect them over and over again we saw it you know just over a month ago when at the 11th hour the eviction moratorium was extended. We saw it last year when there was a month of lapse and then people, um, you know, had a, a new moratorium that was um, put into place federally. And the thing is, that doesn't really help renters to ha know that they have housing security. Imagine if you're behind on rent, you know that a moratorium is going to be expiring in just a few days. And in just a few days, you may lose your home. Waiting to the 11th hour doesn't help out renters who are living in the, that anxiety, who may be preemptively leaving their homes and doubling up or going to shelters because they don't want an eviction on their record. It's just been a mess of a process, but it really has shown that um, the United States and uh, many local and state governments are not prepared to handle crisis well. When we talk about, you know, the amount of um, rental assistance that is available, you know, the $46 billion, which is actually not enough, um, the $46 billion um, that is available to cover uh, back rent owed and some future rent for people who are still experiencing financial hardship. Um, we do not have the systems in place to really get it out strategically and quickly. And that's the thing that I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about. Right. Extending the moratorium on evictions is not canceling rent. We can talk about that another time. I do think rent should be canceled. Not everyone agrees with me. Um, you know, what, no, what I don't does, agree with you. Yeah, what it does is that um, it extends the amount of time where renters are able to recover from uh, any lost wages that may put them in rent arrears or make them owe back rent. So what this eviction moratorium right now is really doing is it's recognizing that there were funds that were allocated for rental assistance that people direly need in this moment. And those funds are not getting out fast enough for a range of reasons. You know, states and localities are under-resourced. They have never had to distribute this amount of money for rent before. Um, there's new paperwork, new processes, new court processes, um, and they're not just caught up enough. So it just doesn't make sense to kick people out while they have active applications for rental assistance programs. So this new moratorium recognizes both these failures to be able to get the money out fast enough, and it also recognizes that evictions are extremely harmful for in a number of ways, but especially in um, uh, in the way that uh, evictions have seen been seen to um, promote the spread and death of COVID-19. No, you're, you're spot on, and, and I'm in favor of the eviction moratorium. I, I don't think anybody should be thrown out of their home in this minute, uh, but I do think that the rent has to be paid uh, I, you know because landlords still have mortgages they have to pay if we we stop this the whole system collapses uh, now we can argue whether the system is broken and it's no good but the way it is right now if the bank repossesses the house the landlord the, the renters are probably going to lose out too i'm in favor of paying the rent and this is where i think the trump administration failed right from the beginning uh, i was saying back when we were telling people you don't you can't go to work that we should have been paying those people a hundred percent of the wages that they were earning to make sure that they could keep paying their bills keep food on the table and not end up in this moment uh, that we're in right now exactly there needed to be systems set in place that would take care of people that's kind of the role of government to be able to take care of the people that it's responsible for and it failed to do that time and time again it continues to fail to do that what taking care of people in this moment means is doing things like you know paying people to be able to stay home paying people to be able to eat and then to live their lives well paying people to be able to pay the rent that they owe right now so that they can make sure that they can stay healthy that their families can stay healthy and that we can actually stop the spread of COVID-19 
in its tracks. But we lost the chance to do that early on. It could still happen where we could, you know, enact um, these really massive mandates as other countries have done uh, last year, you know, a year and a half ago. Um, but we had clear messaging from the Biden administration that they're not willing to do that. Yeah, no, and it's it's we'll see where this takes us. But the sad reality is, is we don't have the mechanisms to to get the kind of, of help to people that they need in these moments. And I still know people who haven't gotten unemployment from last year because that you know, unemployment system is still to this day. You can't call and get anybody on the phone because it's con the lines are constantly jammed because we haven't done enough to do this, um, which is why I think most people are fortunate enough to have gotten through it. Uh, most people that I know are fortunate enough to have had a little bit of savings, had a little cushion. The sad reality is uh, when you start looking at people in the bottom, the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, they didn't have that cushion. They're the ones who are being most abused. And I look at the disabled as you know even more abused and, and generally pushed to the side and, and with you know, really nobody out there to, to advocate for them. Yeah, when it comes to um, housing, we are we have just a dire housing affordability shortage where we have not enough number of uh, affordable housing units. And what that means is that people are forced to rent above their means, and then that makes them more likely to fall back behind on rent or um, or uh, be at risk for eviction because they are then more rent burdened. So, you know, if there are no units that are at the 30% of your household income, then you're forced to, uh, you know, rent a unit that is 50% of your income or more. And growing, growing numbers of people are in these situations. And when it comes to renters with dis disabilities, some research, research, research that I did with some of my colleagues was really showing that renters with disabilities sometimes twice as likely that they expect to be facing eviction in the next few months. Um, this is a, a group of people who already have such a difficult time being able to rent um, low income housing uh, options because, you know, there isn't enough accessible housing and housing that's made accessible, you know, even, you know, housing that has just a couple of steps can be inaccessible to many, um, a, along with a many other um, needed infrastructure pieces in affordable housing. And then we also have an affordable housing shortage. So we have even more of a shortage of affordable and accessible housing. And then if you tie in, you know, the need for multiple rooms, because your family, it's just an impossible thing already. So especially during the pandemic, when people are worried about their health, when people are losing jobs and losing wages, and then they're already in a situation where housing was a, was a really difficult um, thing for them to be able to both maintain and obtain, you know, it's just putting an exacerbated amount of uh, inequalities that are going on right now, especially for you know disabled renters, um, and then we can also you know talk about renters of colors, um, single mothers, uh, a whole bunch of groups of people who have been historically kind of excluded from housing markets in a fair way um, that are now really bearing extra brunt in in the situation that we're in. Yeah, you know, I've been saying for years that we need a new a new housing policy. At some point, we've got to build affordable housing for, for working people. And, you know, I go back to the era when, when of the Levittown era, uh, where there were a number of, of communities that were built uh, kind of like where my grandparents lived. Uh, it was a it was a planned community and they were all very modest homes, very well built, uh, you know, out of brick and out of two by six and uh, good, sturdy homes, but not not elaborate, not you know bungalows and, and you know, ranch style things, but affordable things that people could afford to live in and subsidized by the government in a way that the builders made a little bit of money, uh, people got affordable housing, and it was good policy. And, and for all of the problems that the Levittowns of the world had, and there were many, it was still the kind of policy that got people affordable housing that my grandparents spent the mass of their lives. And in, in fact, you know, they spent all of their retirement and passed away in those in that house. Um, we, we don't do that anymore. All the builders are making now are these these giant McMansions that virtually no working person can afford. And we do see patterns like that happening right now where there's actually a, a, a huge increase in luxury housing that's being built at the moment while we see um, you know, more and more need for affordable and, and low income housing. So there's, there's definitely a mismatch, not just in available housing for renters to choose from, but available housing that is in within the means of your household income. So, you know, if we look at the amount of um, uh, empty uh, units for luxury housing, it is way more than the amount of empty units for affordable housing because we have an affordable housing shortage and we have a luxury housing surplus at the moment. So there's a mismatch there. So even if you're looking at like the raw numbers and there's kind of this kind of misguided 
um, argument that there are more houses than people who need it in the United States. So why don't just we just, uh, you know, let people have those housing? Um, yeah, let people have housing. But what people don't understand is that a lot of the housing that is vacant are extremely expensive. They're luxury units or they're extremely unsafe where they have mold. They're, um, uh, you know, really old buildings that haven't had enough maintenance. So we need to both not only build more affordable housing, but repair the housing that does exist so that it becomes safe and accessible. And, you know, uh, the Center for American Progress recently um, endorsed a couple of bills that were coming out of the House Financial Services Committee in Maxine Waters' office, the Ending Homelessness Act of 2020, 2021, and the Housing is Infrastructure Act of 2021. And what those both do is uh, they are attempting to make housing choice voucher programs um, entitlement programs. So what that means is instead of the kind of you're in, you know, a thousandth in line in your city to get a housing voucher, it makes it so that every household that is eligible can get to that voucher. And that's an attempt to um, completely reduce and eliminate homelessness so that everybody who needs a housing voucher can get it. And the Housing as Infrastructure Act recognizes that there is that need for more affordable housing and there's that need for repairs for affordable housing. So it has uh, funds that are, um, that would be allocated to exact, do exactly that, build affordable housing and repair the housing that we do have so that it is safe and accessible for, for renters. Right. And the reason I bring up the Levittown model is because I, I had I have a listener who, who said, but that was all privatized. It was all private builders. Uh, the government wasn't involved in it without knowing that the government actually was heavily involved in it, heavily subsidized it because it was policy. And this is the kind of where my mind is going with what you're talking about. We need government action. We need government spending. Uh, we need to, to make sure that the supply chains are, are available to feed this kind of mass building that we most certainly need in this in this moment if this pandemic has shown us anything is a lot of the systems in this country are broken and and right now is the time to to take this crisis and i think uh, make things better yeah, what happened, what we're seeing happening, you know, we've seen it happen for a long time, especially now, especially with privatized hand, uh, housing and corporate landlords is that we're seeing very concentrated, very rich people owning huge swaths of rental housing markets where they own tens of thousands of rental units sometimes. And they, you know, within their their access of, of to funds and access to means and, and legal help, they have a huge body behind them that can control the fates of, you know, literally tens of thousands of households. Um, so we can see this happening right now that where the, you know a lot of private markets are actually the drivers of housing insecurity because they use their means to um, produce a model of housing that profits off of things like evictions. It profits off of things like making sure that maintenance is not taken care of. It profits off of things like even charging, you know, in, in insane amounts of um, uh, you know application fees and things like that that have been skyrocketing in some cities. Even though we've some, seen some legislation to control the amount of uh, application fees that um, landlords are allowed to to uh, to put in place. Right. And, but, you know, the thing is, is you know, we were just talking about this the other night on the show. Um, the fact that you know, hedge funds are now buying up a lot of the a lot of the available rental units. And my fear is uh, once we if we allow the uh, the renters to not have to pay the money back through. And I think the government has to fund that. Uh, I see landlords going broke and this just becoming one of those moments where uh, the hedge funds come in, sweep up things for pennies on the dollar. And now we've recreated uh, the company towns. Only now it's not a, a you know, XYZ company. Now it's Wall Street that owns everything. And I think that's a horrible thing. Last question I've got for you, because, you know, here we are in this moment. Uh, I, I fully expect the courts to overturn this. Uh, isn't this Congress's job to step in and do something? It could have been, but it, they didn't act fast enough. And um, I know less about the courts, so I won't really speak on that. And from what I've heard from the experts that I do work with, it's still very complicated. And um, there are a lot of experts that are combing through what can and can't be done at the moment at the Supreme Court level and even at the local court level at sometimes. Um, but at the end of the day, like we kind of started this conversation off with, there are a lot of bodies that could have done something sooner. And because it was saved into the last minute again, and because nobody was taking action, and because there was a lot of your pointing going on nothing got done and now we're in a situation where we can see you know millions of households that may be risk of eviction again very soon either because the current moratorium will lapse on october 3rd and that's just not enough time for people to um, get back on their feet or because uh something happens and um, the moratorium is not enforced at local levels 
Yeah, and it's not enough. It's certainly not enough time to get the money out the door. Because as I said, I still know people who, you know, back from March and April and May of last year, haven't gotten unemployment benefits. Uh, need a little bit more time, and I think you have to stop uh, the banks from coming in and snatching everything up. But Joe Jabo, I appreciate you taking time for us. Uh, keep up the great work there at the Center for Market and Progress. Appreciate your time. Of course, thank you. Uh, good stuff, Jaboa. Like, make sure you check out the work they do, AmericanProgress.org, the website. Uh, she's a senior policy analyst over there at the Poverty to Prosperity Program. Love to hear your thoughts. Uh, you can email me, Rick, at the RickSmithShow.com. Should we, should we extend the moratorium? Uh, should we pay the people's rent? Or like Jaboa said, should we just cancel it all together? You can email me, Rick, at the RickSmithShow.com. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. Rick 